Welcome from uh, Pietro. Welcome from the limited edition. It's a special day today. We're going to host for the second time the great David Brailsford from Garrick, one of our absolute favorite artisan watchmakers. And we have a bit of uh, news as well to share you know, with you. As always, we're going to try to give value with these interviews by sharing some you know, previews, insider information, so you know where things are going. And when it's about independent British watchmaking, is particularly val valuable as uh, uh, it is one of those topics that has become, I wouldn't say taboo, uh, but kind of difficult to tackle. So we'll try to do that today with our editor, Johnny from Ireland, that I always thank for his support on these live interviews, and our special guest, David Braceford from Garrick, so co-founder, co-owner of Garrick Watches. So we'll get them um, now in the show uh, without any further ado, and uh, yes, look at both these gentlemen looking great, looking crisp, and looking sharp on a sunny British uh, Friday uh, morning. Very How cool. are you, gents? Okay, thanks. I'm brilliant. True to form, we're having a nice grey Irish summer morning here, like you know. So, uh, in between the downpours, we're uh, every time happy. I ever see Johnny, it brings a smile to my face every time. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to palpitations, I know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Great to see you, palpitations gentlemen. Palpitations were you and uh, smiles were Johnny. Me and Johnny go back a long way, many years. Yeah. We do go back a long way. Salon yeah. QP 2010 or something yeah. like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When, and, uh, when in... Lot, uh, what? Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, a lot of beers were drunk at that time. Um, me, Johnny, and uh, Mark Jenny, remember, till about three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> In yes. that hotel, yeah, it's cracking, absolutely cracking and time. Today is going to be one of those situations. There was an Irish man, an Italian man, and then a British man uh, talking yeah. watches, talking watchmaking, talking the nice things in life. And we are really privileged, Johnny, to be able to have David, uh, you know, in the first place, because David is not somebody that really likes the limelight uh, as much as we do. No. Uh, we're always, always live uh, telling stories. Uh, very, very hard to pin down. Um, it would be really a great opportunity, Johnny, to ask some direct questions and to understand more about the development of Garrick. Who is, you know, Garrick simply one of the very, very few brands that can quite rightly call itself an artisanal British watchmaker, which is a title that has been uh, flying around quite a bit over the last few few years, but it took years and years for uh, for Gary to be able to wear that hat. And how relevant is that, Johnny, before we go in more of the details of the development of the brand at the moment? I actually think the Gary story goes back even before I met David, because he, whenever I met him back in 2010 on that infamous uh, uh, evening that he just mentioned there, that this idea was uh, fermenting in his mind. And uh, this passion that he had back then for uh, the revival of English watchmaking, because English watchmaking has an incredible and very important uh, heritage that played a huge part and a significant role in the establishing what we would consider to be the fundamental principles of contemporary watchmaking. Things that do te uh, technology and innovations that are still in use, albeit more refined today, obviously, thanks to manufacturing uh, processes and uh, 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 much greater tolerances uh, being uh, you know, in incorporated into, into watchmaking nowadays. But the fundamentals started back then, and David had this passion back then, this vision that nobody was doing was really looking after preserving after George Daniels. Yes, it was Roger W. Smith, but th th these were not watches that anybody could buy. And that, I think, is where David uh, set up the uh, Garrick company with that kind of philosophy to make handcrafted watches. And there's so many, sm so much smoke and mirrors in watchmaking that. Do, for, for somebody to be so honest about how he makes his watches and how much of them he is making in house, and uh, I, I think it's uh, very important. I was speaking well, to bear a very in mind, we... back, but you're right, back in the day, there was literally nobody. Um, 
you know, and, and there wasn't, and nobody was taking British brands seriously at all. Uh, nobody. Uh, they are now, yeah. of course. There's a, there's a lot of decent British brands now, and um, all innovators, uh, all doing unique things, you know, and, and this is the point. But uh, back in the day, there was absolutely nothing, and it was a nightmare. We had nobody to learn off. We were learning it on the fly, so to speak. Um, you know, it, I know, it, I know. David, I know that you don't like particularly lingering on uh, on the British watchmaking, you know, macro topic. But is it fair to say that today, for the understanding of people that are watching this, uh, um, and because of the smoke and mirrors that Johnny uh, just mentioned, is it fair to say that there are basically two categories? There are very few British artis artisans, and there are quite a few British brands that are either uh, Britishly yeah, owned yeah. or they operate yeah. from England, but obviously they yeah. have different ways of producing, which there's nothing wrong, obviously, with it, but it's nice, yeah, to, yeah. to, it's, it's nice to point, point out the differences. And in terms of the, uh, the, the few artisans, definitely you can wear that hat. And how proud are, yeah. are you that having achieved the level that... Is, is you know, and the respect that is given these days to you know Roger Smith and to uh, Rebecca Struders or to Frodsham, for example, these are the names that come to mind when we think about Garrick. Yeah, I agree. Um, there are two categories, and um, you've got to have that distinction because, like you say, it causes issues um, with collectors who kind of don't understand what they're buying and where the value is in the watch, and, and that's the point. But every brand's you know, got its plus points and um, there's some cracking British brands. You know, I, it doesn't matter where your watches are made in reality. A lot of collectors don't care. But the point is, you, you know, you have to make that distinction and you have to let them know why your watches are at a certain price bracket. Um, that's the frustration. Yeah, so being, being, transpa being transparent about, you know, how things happen, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, get, it's getting that message out because the thing is it's not viable for most brands to make dials in-house. It isn't viable for brands to make hands and finish cases and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's just so time-consuming, labour-intensive, uh, and, and it costs a lot of money. It takes the profit away. And, you know, and, and so that's why 90% of brands don't do it. But, you know, there's a lot of brands in the UK doing some damn good stuff, you know. And there Absolutely. Is yeah, you know, Nick from Fears, uh, what he's doing with Fears, uh, James Lamb, again, uh, you know, a massive fan of James. And, uh, you know, and then you've got unique brands like Schofield, obviously. And, uh, you know, I, and, and believe it or not, I'm a massive fan of um, Pinion. Um, you know, he's honest where his watches come from, but I love the designs. He's a designer. And I think, and I, you know, I own a pin, opinion in my collection. Um, I just think this thing. There's some cracking British brands doing some really unique stuff and uh, they don't tend to copy off anybody else. And that's the beauty of it. Same as, you know, uh, they've all got a unique identity. Uh, remember, I don't, I, we spoke about this before. Remember years ago uh, uh, at Basel World, every year, every brand did the same thing. It was Torbions one year, GMTs, whatever. Um, the good thing about independents, British brands especially, but independents in general, they all seem to just do their own thing and don't copy um, yeah, and yeah. they've all got a you know unique take on on a, on a design, and and that's what makes independence so exciting, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And when but I look it, at the your sorry, Johnny. So no, I, I, I do I agree. I think it, it's uh, a brand, a particular a brand, and let's just focus on David's brand on Garrick has its own identity, and its identity is in the aesthetics, which are yeah. absolutely recognisable from a hundred paces which I always marvel at uh, how difficult that is to achieve in a watch that you know, it's is extremely in, difficult. Yeah. Something that, that uh, is encased in a 42 millimeter case. And uh, to, so to be able to uh, have that strength of identity uh, is, is something that's very, very uh, unique. And uh, just, I, I know from knowing David for so long, the passion, like the, that's a, a word that is much overused, much overused. And the, and the, sorry, Johnny, but also the clarity of the mission, because David, what, it, what I love about Garrick, you're not just randomly showcasing a skill set of craftsmanship and, uh, and uh, you know, handmade techniques uh, for the sake of, you know, a, a marketing idea that you had in mind. But when you took the responsibility of kind of helping resuscitating British watchmaking, you took some of the codes of classic British watchmaking uh, you know, the frosting, the guilloche, the, you know, yeah. some techniques that were forgotten and how, how much, for example, the guilloche has now become a trend even within Swiss. Uh, Everybody's doing it, yeah. Exactly. Doing I think it. you were one of the first and got 
going to the extent of uh, doing it by by hands. And well, sorry, I, I, before... I think I think we've I think we've innovated on numerous things. We were the first to do the like skeletonized heat blue chapter ring, um, which which has been copied since. Um, but we did that years ago. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things we were doing that were extremely difficult. But you know, I've, we've got this thing about our aesthetic as well. I think if a watch is handmade, it should look handmade. Full stop. Uh, it shouldn't look mass produced in any way, shape, or form. And there's always right. slight imperfections. You know, um, uh, and that's what collectors tend to love. Um, you know, we we don't confess or, or or you know we don't shout that we're big on high-end finishing or anything like that and our watches are in a in a in a in the right price bracket but you know we we've improved our techniques over the years and and you know all our early stuff you might you might say it was quite crude um some of the really early stuff like the shaftesbury and the hoxton um you know but that you know we're, we don't think that's anything to be embarrassed about um you know we were experimenting at the time like no, say, especially we had no when to when you were starting at a price point in those days yeah. of, you know two thousand pound for a handmade yeah, watch yeah, so, exactly. yeah, the, yeah. You, you managed to do that always keeping the value as the as the as the no, northern star and but Sorry you soon to, realize, though, Pietro, when you're doing watches in that price bracket, how ridiculous it actually is. And I remember when we were doing yeah. the Norfolk with a fired enamel dial, for God's sake. And anyone will tell you it does enamel dials, you'll throw five away if you if you make ten. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, we were doing that at two thousand and some pound um, before we had to raise the price because we were just literally yeah. making no money. Um, you know, and and it's a learning curve with enamel dials. It is. I remember we went to uh, selling QP and. Um, Xavier from Chapek come running over and said, Dave, I've heard you're doing enamel dials in house. You must be crazy. Uh, and I showed him one. He was like, God smacked. And he said, I can't believe you're doing it at that price. And they, well, neither could I, frankly. Um, yeah. You know, but it's. Uh, That's been the story like, of your life. I can't yeah, believe yeah. I can do that. that I'm still price, a million yeah. pounds short of being a millionaire, yeah. you know, as I keep telling everybody. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it's it's not easy and, and it isn't. But this is why I'm saying certain brands don't go down that route. We decided to because it was a, at the time. We don't need to anymore. But at the time, it was about shouting about British watchmaking. That's all and it matters to us. And, and it's about, David, giving first to then get recognition, to get the yeah. respect. We see this in independent watchmaking, even in the development of the limited edition, Johnny, how many times we had this conversation. Yeah. You give first, you show love to collectors first by, by offering true value. And then and then you build, you know, you build your growth there. Well, we but, spoke about this many times. You're right. Yeah, I agree. I'm, uh, I wanted to uh, make reference to those beautiful images that Johnny has shared with us before. Johnny, what are we seeing? And incidentally, that's the reason of our chat today, because yeah, today obviously. we are officially launching uh, uh, a new collection for Garrick, uh, which is already on the limited edition and, of course, on the Garrick website. Johnny, what are we seeing here that you just shared with us? <clears throat> this is uh, the Garrick Regulator Mark II, and uh, this in particular is the piece with the uh, frosted dial and uh, in in dark blue, royal blue, and um, <clears throat> it, it, it it's which is actually one of those things, uh, David. You because each watch is is manufactured pretty much to order. You can do a, a wide range anything. of colors yeah, and uh, personalization. Uh, on, on each Johnny, watch, we, yeah? ne we never we never build a, a watch that a standard watch. It just doesn't exist on our build sheets. We, every time a client contacts us, it's something unique. We've never ever ever built two watches the same. Um, Amazing. There's so, there's so many combinations. Uh, people want different hand colours. They want different hand finishing. Some want the hands frosted. Some want them brushed. Some want them polished. Uh, some want them heat blued. Some like the Gary Kanker hands. Then you've got the different dial colours, the movement colour. The sky's the limit. It's crazy. And different finishes on the case. Um, you know, we, we, we've grain the edges, uh, polish the tops, or some people want the whole case as polished, some people want the case uh, frosted. We do a gunmetal finish on the case by bead blasting. So honestly, it's just never ended. But there, there's something worth pointing out on this watch. So the, 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 the thing is with us, as we've just been speaking about, we're always trying to keep the prices low. I don't know why we do it, frankly. Um, as a business, we just never make any money. Uh, <laughs> but we've just got this thing about trying to make our watches. For the glory. Yeah, well, I wish. Um, 
But it's certainly not for fame and fortune. That's a fact. But <laughs> the, the thing is, there are little things you can do to, 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 to make the aesthetics better and, and add, you know, but... The, it's like this is one thing that's just worth pointing out on, on these. Like you, you have the hour wheel sticking out from underneath the. Uh, bear in mind these watches are prototypes, by the way. Uh, the you have the hour wheel sticking out above the balance rim that you see. Um, yeah. You could skeletonize that, and, and we would. And, and the point is, we will do if a client asks. But the reason we don't do it on the standard watch is because again, it's more man hours, adds more cost to the watch, and. Um, you know, it's worth pointing these things out. It's, we're always trying to keep costs down, always. So we, we see here a festival of craftsmanship and a festival of techniques that are reminiscent of the British <clears throat> watchmaking tradition. But also, um, uh, David, how important is the regulator? Because this is the Mark II, which obviously means that it's the uh, successor of a Mark I that you launched in the early days of Garrick. Why was the regulator always very important for you? Why do you feel inspired by the regulator? The, reg the, reg the regulator Mark I was massive for us because we kind of plodded along for two or three years with the Shaftesbury and the Hoxton, uh, which were kind of very basic Um handmade dials and then we just wanted to do something a little bit special so we we launched the regulator mark one and um, and it was it was three sub dials so obviously a standard regulator has the hand from the center the minute hand well the 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 regulator mark one had the three sub dials offset um so um, and it looked more like a chronograph and that's what and no one had done it before that's what appealed to everybody and, and literally it was the first watch we ever sold out of ever uh, we said we were going to do we announced 10 pieces and they sold the same day which was incredible for us at the time we mm -hmm. were kind of gobsmacked because that never happened to us as a brand um, and then we announced the engine turn version sometime later they all sold out and then it became like the, the staple it was our biggest seller i say biggest seller bear in mind we only build 50 to 70 watches per year so uh, <laughs> anything's a good seller to us um, but the it, it was a, it was just so unique and it spread like wildfire everybody loved it because it was a very 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 unique you know design with the three sub did, did, did the inspiration uh, come from um, from the british pocket watches there obviously we can see uh, an incredible collection of the british museum and uh, the museum of science in oxford as well for example yeah well, well we've always been inspired by i'm a massive clock collector i mean you can't see at the back of me i've got a room full of clocks um I'm a massive collector of clocks and uh, mantle clocks, grandfather clocks uh, that are frankly worthless now, which is a pity. Um, you know, yeah, I'm always inspired by stuff like that. And we're, I'm always looking at dials and um, <clears throat> looking at movements. And, 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 and back in the day, and don't forget, our, our staple movement all the way through has been the Unitas, not this one, um, the, uh, on the regulator. And what we did on the regulator, Mark 1, we reversed the movement over um, and showed and, and showed the balance rim on the front, but but it was an ETA. Um, with this one, this was our kind of first in-house caliber that we designed with Andreas, um, and and this was a big thing for us as well. Um, you know, so we, we've kind of done different things over the years, but we like the simple frosting. It, you know, you look at old clocks and and British pocket watches. They were they a lot of them were never heavily engraved, and and everybody for years and years before we started, even British brands were doing Geneva stripes and whatnot, and the, yeah. we just decided to go down a different route, and um, of course. we went for frosting from day one um it, some people like it some people don't but i just think it shows the movement off more um I, you know it's um I, it's it's just a, a very simple aesthetic but it works i think it's a contemporary touch in the layout i don't know johnny if you agree but i like the contemporary touch in the layout that trusts with a very um uh, you know historical vibe that the obviously the rest of the architecture of the you know the dial and the, and and the case and and the crown for that you know for that sake you know with the onion onion shaped uh, crown for example yeah we've always gone for that because obviously it's like a traditional pocket watch crown um yeah. you know and that's why we've always gone for the onion crown this has been refined since the original one the original one was a bit bigger um this is flatter on the top with the with the garrick symbol in the middle um, mm -hmm. So that, that it, ha it has changed there, but you know, um, the, we we the, the the cases we we do all the finishing in house on the cases, and um, you know that's why we don't heavily engrave anything. We're just not into 
engraving. If the client wants the case back engraving, then we'll add it. But most people tend to leave it as it is. Again, it's got that handmade nature um, to it, and and that's the thing. It's uh, from day one when when and it's back back to anything um, with with the way the regulators evolve. We just wanted to take it up a notch and so we went for the in-house caliber with the balance rim on the front but then that brings a whole set of problems because then you've got to try and get the, the dial to balance and um, we went back and forth for so long trying to get this to work yeah, the, uh, the oversized the oversized trinity balance is one of your signature really from the beginning yeah but then trying to get the sub dials to work was a nightmare and uh, which is why if you look the hour uh, dial on the at three o'clock position is a lot bigger than the seconds dial at 10 um, because we just couldn't get the aesthetics to work. And we tried the badge in different places. And, and this is the thing that nobody realizes when you're designing or watching the background, anyone will tell you, you go back and forth, back and forth forever in a day. You sit back for a day, then you go back to it the next day. And, and, a, and a, a, we've spoke about this before as well. A designer always said to me that, you know, that if you look at something, you're rumming an iron and you don't know what it is, then it's a fail full stop you have to come to it and you have to instantly go wow i like it if you don't and even if you can't pinpoint it and there's something wrong and that's the process we went through with this dial um you know the arguably there'll be a lot of people that don't like it um but the thing is um we think we've got it right and um but and, and, but we did play around with moving the dials all over the place and and the issue you have as well with the regulator um we the the hour dial originally was at the two o'clock position but it looked like two eyes in a math <laughs> which is why we offset it and made it made the hour dial bigger so all these things you have to take into consideration when you it really it really works and you know despite and johnny you tell me your opinion as well but despite this big trend for smaller cases as well i think the 42 millimeters is a sweet spot that really allows to wear me, yeah. the watch yeah perfectly and to play yeah. a little bit you know with the aesthetics and the contrasts in a way that is in this piece for me it needs odd oddity in terms of the layout it, it really works what, what do you think johnny for, for me yeah uh, I, I think it's uh, again uh, uh, harkening back to what i said it's a lot of, about the, the the identity the brand identity the dna signature footprint whatever you like at uh, of the brand including the movement i was probably not surprised to hear david say that you know some people don't like the uh, austere uh, frosted yeah. finishing on it johnny but, you have, you have, when you when you're running a watch brand you have to be able to take it on the chin uh, oh completely going to like but, what you do it's, it's I, I i also think if if uh, if something does not challenge uh uh, the taste buds, if you like it, do it, if it's bland and neutral, it doesn't have a strong personality. And I think that you need to have something uh, to to have a, a strong personality as a, yeah. as your watches do have. That it, you need to have that uh, something that is well. And then, this is the thing with with the regulator. We've done the we've done the thin chaptering um, around the outer edge now, which is kind of the aesthetic we've gone for on the S six and. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring everything into line and make the watches instantly recognizable. Um, you know, and you have to go through these changes. It's always a process. Um, can you, you know, list? Uh, can you list again the amount of handmade processes that we can see here between, uh, you know, between, well, between the front and the back? The dial is extremely complex to make, believe it or not, because I mean, I showed uh, Johnny a picture yesterday of the. Um, of the blanks, the dial blanks, it's literally just raw brass. Um, and, and, you, and I showed him a picture of the, the brass dial blank, which is the base dial, the, the sub dials and the chaptering, all just bare raw brass um, cut from a sheet. And that's how that dial starts out. So then you, you have to make the base dial, but you have to put the feet on the dial, which we rivet. And then um, we kind of um, use an emery to get the, uh, to, to take the um, the rivets off on the on the top of the dial, um, the, we you, then you've got to clean the dial, finish and frost it, or or put it or engine turn it. Um, the sub dials are basically cut, um, engraved, rhodium plated, um, and then infilled with ink. So then markers aren't printed. We don't print dials. Every single marker you see is is infilled by hand, believe it or not, oh, which is, which takes forever and a day. Yeah. Um, and that's no, honestly, that's um, the biggest job on that dial. Um, 
you know, the, the dial, the same with the chapter ring. The, the chapter ring is literally um, plated. Um, it's, it's grain first. It's called, we call spinning. Spinning is basically when you put, watchmakers will know what we mean. It's grain, circular grain, and you basically put it on a on a lathe. You spin the lathe, and then you put you you put a piece of emery cloth, and it's and it gives the grain in effect on the sub dials and on the chapter ring. Uh, you know that the chapter ring's got to be finished. The, when when all this is done, the the sub dials and the chapter ring are then mounted on top of the dial. And, and the, the, the screws that come through at certain positions, and you might just be able to see them on this image. If you look at eight o'clock and four o'clock and 12 o'clock, that's the ends of the screws coming through. And then they're inked on top so that you don't actually see them. And that's how they're all held in place. Um, you know, and the same as the sub dials, you can see the ends of the screws, um, you know, nine and three and then 45 and 50 um, coming through. Um, but like I say, everything is then we is haven't, mounted, we... screw, screw, screwed together, and then and then it's uh, oh, there's another thing that's worth pointing out on this dial. You see on the on the hour dial, there's like a rim going around the outer edge. That's a machine. That's machine from a disc. It's basically like a, a, a polished metal washer that we friction mount on the edge of the dial just to give it a, a different look. And so again, all that is done by hand, uh, and it takes. We haven't even started to talk about the movement, have we? <laughs> no, no. Uh, so you know, and you've got case finishing as well. It takes hours yeah. to polish a case up from scratch. It's raw metal. Um, you know, and we use a local engineering company to make our cases. Uh, we make one offs in house, uh, tens and twenties. We use a local engineering company we've used for quite some time, but they're in their raw state when they come to us. So the cases are made in the UK as well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, and you want to tell us the, uh, yeah, about sorry. the movement as well? Do you want to tell us about the movement as well? Yeah, so, so obviously, the movement, the biggest thing on the movement, obviously, it's beveling um, the bridges and the balance cock and the pallet cock. Um, our watchmaker, Stuart, does, does all the beveling and finishing. Some people prefer a deeper bevel, which we do for certain clients. It's Again, it's an added extra. Um, if people want to go for it, we do screwed chatons on some movements. Again, if a client wants that, we'll do it. But, you know, you look at that, the, the, the click has to be finished. The screws have to be polished. The... Um, the the graining that you see on the base movement, the main plate, that has to be done. The bridges have to be finished. You know, they're done on a jig borer. Um, the hardest bit, believe it or not, um, and I've spoken about this before, is the is the plating. Um, the plating can be a nightmare, which is why a lot of people don't bother doing it in-house because um, the failure rate on plating is quite high. Gold's really easy to do, but rhodium is an, an absolute nightmare. And, and we've only just recently perfected the black plating, which we do on some movements. So that's an option. Um, that took months and months of work because, again, the failure. I mean, that's a that's a lightly rhodium plated movement, um, and it looks stunning in my opinion. I prefer the rhodium over the gold, but a lot the, of people yeah. go for pink gold. On the gold plating, aesthetically, you chose the more contemporary pink gold kind of look yeah. rather than the the old uh, old school um, yellow yellow gold. Was that was that a definite aesthetic decision, or did it come from a you know technical a technical? No, match? we get we get a few clients that ask for yellow gold, but it's it, it's then it's salmon if you want to call it that, and yeah. um, and everybody yeah. likes it. So yeah, but but my favourite's rhodium by far. I just think that's got an engineered look the one that you're showing at the moment. And that's what I like about it. But it's down to personal taste. taste. Um, you know, I think as well, when we were doing rhodium movements a long time back, most people at the time were doing gold and Geneva stripes and all this kind of thing. We were doing um, this type of dial, finely frosted. And, um, and there wasn't many other people doing it at the time. I'm talking years ago. And it's become, it's, it's part of our DNA now. And, yeah. and I, I just think it's got that simple engineered look. Um, you don't have to go overboard with anything. Um, yeah. as, as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, I've always had this thing on the movements. I don't like overly decorated movements. It's not my opinion that matters. It's yeah. clients' opinions that matters. But people seem to like what we're doing. And we very rarely get asked to do any kind of engraving other than on the um, on the balance cock. Um, that's the only thing that we ever really end up engraving, to be honest. <clears throat> yeah, it's actually, it, it, it is uh, a very faithful uh, tribute to... Uh, 
the watchmaking that was going on in, in uh, England in the seventies. Well, I think they've got like, like like Pietro said, they've got like a pocket watch look to them, and yeah, that's no, the kind no of, doubt about it. And they're they're, that, they're that's, the, that's the aesthetic that we like. And and listen, you can go overboard. We've spoken about this before, as we. You can go overboard when it comes to finishing and whatnot, and and yeah. a lot of brands are, 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 are really like insistent that it has to be up to a certain level. But you know, I had some good advice off a good friend of mine, Andreas Strayler, as we all know, he's a damn good friend. Um, you yes. know, he's helped us out over the years a million times over. Incredible talent. He once said to me, Dave, he said, you know, I was banging on about it, and he just said, Dave, he goes, listen, he goes, build it to the best of your ability, because that's all you can do. And people, he goes, you don't ever go overboard. Don't do what you can't do and you're not good at. He said, build the watchers to your ability, and that's it. He goes, and that's all I do. If people want to criticise, he said, let them criticise. And that was a good piece of advice. Uh, yeah. It might sound simple advice, but the point is you're always trying to better yourself, and uh, and you get quite stressed and obsessed with it. Any watchmaker will tell you the same, and all the brands will tell you the same. Um, you, you, you become overly obsessed. Because I can remember, I don't know whether you remember, both of you will know, when when the loop system appeared at Basel World a few years back, um, and 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 – Watchmakers were absolutely, literally uh, having heart attacks <laughs> because all the journeys <laughs> these things are. You remember uh, pulling them out and looking at watches and finding faults on watches. And, and, I've got mine uh, here. I've got mine here. Yeah, yeah. And, and everybody was like, "Oh my god!" Um, you know, and uh, and but that's when Andreas said to me, "Because Dave, I don't care." He said, um, "He said if they find a fault, they find a fault." He said, um, "I'm doing these watches in house." He said, then "There's going to be problems." Uh, you know, and then listen, you can look at what any one of Andreas's watches. There aren't any issues with them. They're, they are spot on and they are perfect. But, but, but they're, they're fine. It's, it's right. so interesting from the artistic perspective. If you think about, you know, to, if I can make a, an analogy with with music, you know, from the beginning of the nineties, you know. Uh, a masterpiece like Nevermind by Nirvana was still a masterpiece, oh, yeah, masterpiece, masterpiece in his well. roughness, if you like. Uh, yeah. But, you know, everyone, I, 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 I love this idea that everyone should play uh, up to his strengths and, and yes, being confident. Yeah. Uh, confident. But also because once again, David, I know you are creeping up to a different uh, positioning now with the development of the in-house movements. And we know there are some uh, other collections down the line. Actually, Johnny, I'm going to try to share, uh, if I can, my, uh, my screen okay. here to just for the sake of, uh, uh, for the sake of illustrating what I have in mind now. Uh, as we see uh, the Garrick, you know, from the initial, the initial days, uh, the collection is now creeping up to the in-house movements, a more sophisticated uh, approach to watchmaking. Uh, we have the Regulator Mark II that is now listed on our platform. Uh, the, the other colors available will be listed as well, but we have some kind of previews as well on future projects. Uh, you can yeah. kind of sneakily, sneakily see here, like the S3 Mark II. So you're definitely going that um, direction, but across the years, you've been offering value, uh, incredible value at very, very entry price level. Uh, what what's what's going to happen uh, now? Where do you see the the brand going? Um, well, I, I was tomorrow. just about to answer actually because I see Paul W posted a um, a question. Great question. And, yeah, and it is it, and it, and it basically it, it, the 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 reason the regulator is so cheap is just because the fools. <laughs> <laughs> the, the profit margins are extremely low, Paul, really, really, really low. And uh, it's just been our philosophy to try and do kind of high-end affordable for God knows how long. We need to change that because we really aren't making much of a profit as a brand. Um, but it, it's, uh, you know, uh, we it's always been our thing. and We want to get watches on risk. We're a small brand. We don't do, uh, you know, we don't go big on advertising. In fact, we don't advertise Um uh, at all it's all about word of mouth and and towards getting watches on wrists is the most important thing um the believe it or not the regulator isn't such a complex build compared to something like the s2 central seconds we have to do quite a few mods to the movement um the existing movement the regulator is a is a couple of gears you know and i'm being brutally honest about this i don't want to make over complicate what it is it's a it's a couple of extra gears and opinion sitting underneath the dial um it's not as much work involved as, say, doing an S3, uh, which uses a similar movement, or the S2 central seconds, and that's why it's cheaper. Um, but our margins are low, um, really, really low. And, and it's like Pietro said earlier, 
we go through this phase and it's you know it's about getting watches on risks it's about um putting things out there and there'll come a time when we will creep the prices up but creeping the prices up we've we've never felt comfortable with to be honest um which is why at the limited change. edition we wisely purchased a few s4 and uh, we yeah, <laughs> do the yeah, same yeah. with the s6 because uh, some yeah. some people will be exposed to garrick in two three four years you don't you don't know of <clears> course <throat> because we it's it's a very it's a gem it's a hidden gem johnny isn't it it's still no in the doubt, grand right. scheme of things um we need more people to know about about this oh, and possibly yeah, give the opportunity yeah. to have access what? When you listen to David explain the processes go into the dial of the the regulator, it it it, it is just astonishing to to know that every part of this is created with, with the the manner the the traditional values that are instilled in every one of these. People watches. don't understand. You know, you look at this watch at the moment. Not. There's little things. You know, any watchmaker would tell. There'll be a lot of watchmakers watching, and they they know the score. Um, you know, but even even on the on on the S4, which is our, our basically entry level models, and you see the little cap that sits inside the anchor hands. Um, you know. That's made on a watchmaker's lathe in the workshop and, and it's spun. So it's spun out of a tube of metal. It's, you know, somebody sits there on a lathe, works that little cap, brushes it, and then it sits in, in the center of the hands. Things like that people take for granted. It's part of the aesthetics of the watch. We've always used these caps, but we don't buy them in. We make them, um, you know, and, the, the, uh, uh, and little things like that are, are all things that take time. And, and, um, and if you... If you think about it, even hands, you know, you're making a set of hands, um, polishing the hands, heat blue in the hands. It all takes time, even putting the cap in and making the cap. Um, you know, if we if we literally worked out everything and, 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 and costed everything correctly, our prices would literally have to be double, as any watchmaker will tell you. It's just yeah. not viable. Um, they would to make the kind of profits and offer it to retailers, which but. You know, we can't offer to retailers. We'll never been ever be in a position to offer watches to retailers. Uh, you know, we do deals and like with with Pietro, and he commissions a, a, a set amount and blah blah blah. Um, but we we can't put watches in retailers. No, number two reasons: number one, we can't actually build enough. There's always a waiting list on everything, so we we, we don't even carry any stock as a brand, which is utterly ridiculous. Um, and then you know we, we're in this position, like I say, where we're um, where we're just trying to keep prices as low as possible, and it's and it's um, it's because I, like you two, I'm passionate. Uh, I'm a collector myself. I love watches. I love independence, and I'm always trying to get these things on wrists. And uh, you know, for some brands, it is about profits, but it but it isn't for us. And I don't want to really sit down and work out all the costings on these things because I'd have a heart attack, literally. Heart and where, where we thrive, and David, I believe you do so as well, like you were saying implicitly. When people discover about a hidden gem like Gary can be today, you're 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 very happy to be supported and to have people on board that then can tell the story. So when you come early Absolutely. enough, then you get access to 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 more value than what you can get later on. When obviously, uh, you know, with with brands expanding, they obviously need to look at profitability more more closely. Yeah, I oh, know we do. We I, I've spoken to you recently. We've spoken on the last um, interview we did about. You know shareholders and whatnot um and i'm always going back and forth <laughs> with the idea um that you know it's a it, it's an issue and people don't understand people like look at a brand like us and they think oh they've got watches at 30k they've got watches at this you know at this price that they must be making an absolute fortune and they don't realize behind the scenes you know it's all there's a lot of investment and um small profits and wages and uh, and things like that and, and like i joked earlier it, and, it, and it is true i'm still a million pounds short of being a millionaire you know i don't want much in life i don't i don't you know, want to take massive money out of the business, neither does Simon. You know, I, I'm one of them guys, I like a beer, I like a whiskey. I'm happy that I'm content with that in life. Um, you know, and, and Johnny, what a what a refreshing uh, point of view when we often discuss uh, discuss about the fact that in independent watchmaking there are two main goals of obviously to sustain you know a decent a decent life and to and to enjoy what you are doing. Uh, uh, with 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 your project, but at the same time to leave a trace in in the history of watchmaking. There's that that goal that becomes yeah. sometimes dominant over the 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 you know the main you know um, <laughs> economical reasons behind. I think uh, yeah, uh, there, there's 
we're, we're kind of identifying one of the big differences between independent and mainstream brands, uh, or not even brands, but watchmaking, two different sides of the industry here. Because one is quite literally about units, selling units. And it's about profit margins, about shareholder value, about uh, uh, about selling uh, a concept. Uh, where with the independent watches, it's this. This is not about selling units. Every watch. Well, you're right. Actually, you've hit the nail on the head, Johnny. Because one of the, one of the interesting points is with a lot of these brands, they have got shareholders breathing down the neck, and um, you know, which is which is not necessarily a good thing and um, you know it puts the people at the top uh, running the brands under immense pressure uh, because uh, you know at the end of the day they've got to pay shareholders back and um, it's something we've never had to worry about you know well that's a that, that, that's a good point because then you've got to increase your profits that's all it's about when you've got shareholders uh, is increased and rightly so everybody wants to return um mm. you know unless course, you know, Unless well, you find the right, say, right. I was about to say, Pietro, I've been slogging away at this for 10 years. <laughs> you know? I, I'm not denigrating shareholders here uh, because no, absolutely not. You need a them. lot of the brands that we see would not exist. So uh, I, I'm not denigrating it. I'm just uh, yeah. identifying for someone like yourself, David, who it, it, it's, as you say, you're producing between 50 and 70 watches every year. This is not about. Uh, mass production of getting your watches out of the, all the, every corner of the world and into the best boutiques. I mean, you may, so this is an interesting thing, actually, because you, you, you're on about a, a lot of independents have the same philosophy, and they actually do. Uh, and, and I always think a, a good a case in point is um, Philippe Norbel, um, who's a good friend of mine. Um, you know, really, when he launched that, and it's a cool watch, when he launched that, and it's handmade from start to finish, the guy is a, is a really, really, really accomplished finisher and whatnot, and watchmaker. No doubt. He launched that watch with no fanfare at all. He, he, all it was, he wanted to build his watch. He worked on it in the background for God knows how long. And, uh, and, and then literally, I asked him, I said, what, why didn't you do a big press release? He went, oh, um, Loads of mistakes, Dave, but it is what it is. But it was dead blasé about it. And uh, that's what I like about the attitude of many uh, watchmakers. Um, it, it isn't when they start off about profits or anything else. Uh, it's a dream for many watchmakers to, yeah. to do that thing and do their and, own and, and, and talking talking of this, uh, it's a brilliant assist because I know that you guys have been conspiring at the back for... Uh, potentially having Garrick to be a present at the best uh, festival of watchmaking that is going to take place again this year in September, at the end of September. Wow. And we are, you, we are mentioning names that may be on the same lineup, uh, Narbel, Garrick, yeah. et cetera, et yeah. cetera. Well, the only problem is with that, I've just got to hope we've got watches uh, <laughs> because that's that kind of what stops us from doing any of these things. We literally have no watches. Uh, Bag, borrow, so, or stay. I, be, yeah, I better well, place I, my I, order I, soon. Well, I'm going to have to beg uh, whoever we're building for and say, look, can I take a watch? Because um, this is the problem. Uh, 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 this is another problem for us as a brand. You know, we have people who come around and we do a lot of tours and uh, show people around and whatnot. And uh, they always expect us to have a sh Oh, we lost. We lost David there. But Johnny, can we officially, can we officially? Uh, oh, can you announce... see me now? Yeah, I've got you there, my friend. You're back. You're yeah, back. I was just saying, uh, you know, a lot of people ask to, sh to look at the showroom and we don't actually have any watches in the showroom. Um, so we have to show them client builds. Um, that's the problem we've got because every time we ever build anything for ourselves, um, somebody rushes in, oh, it's a wedding, it's a birthday. Can you please, please sell it to me? Oh, yeah, you beggars. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah, actually, yeah, that's a good point. And, uh, but so <laughs> we've never got anything. And uh, that, that's another issue for us. But uh, the thing is, it's this running waiting list all the time, um, you know, and it, that's hard to manage because my biggest stress uh, as, as a brand owner and ideal person with every single client, uh, who are, a lot of them become really good friends and they're quite understanding. But I have nightmares about delivering watches on time. Um, so and, and, you know, and, I, and I was talk I, I don't know whether I told you recently, I was talking to a client, an American guy, um, and, and, and I was having a bit of a conversation with him. I was getting stressed about delivering his watch. It was about two months late. And he just said, Dave, Dave, listen. And I, and I thought, what's he going to say when everybody's late and he kind of made me laugh and, and the way he said it and I, and I stepped back and thought you know what 
you're bloody right. Uh, what am I worried about? Very, I take it's things very like true. personally. And your, your honesty and openness in explaining things makes it that uh, intelligent collectors that we all attract in this beautiful uh, area of the business, yeah. they understand. We have the same thing. We have been selling watches for 2025 you know, 2024, 2025. Yeah. And everyone knows that, you know, for artisanal watchmaking, sometimes things are under control most of the times, but sometimes, you know, there are delays that are inevitable. But uh, going back to my previous point, so Johnny, can we officially then announce that if if not to see a Garrick watch, people see, can yeah. join us at the International Festival of Time to, yeah, to meet uh, David and having intelligent conversations about watchmaking. Yeah. <laughs> well, we could have conversations. And uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be too specific yeah. as to say it would be intelligent conversation, <laughs> but um, definitely, I, I look, I'm really looking forward to it. It's a, it's a, a huge uh, event. It's a good lineup, it's, really good lineup. Yeah, we've got a great lineup. We have uh, we have David Cando, we have uh, Paul Gerber, Paul we Gerber, have yeah. uh, uh, Carrie Vitalinen, we have Simon Brecht, Andreas, uh, uh, Luke Monet, Cyril Grieve, and uh, it is so, uh, uh, to Kudo, list of, of, them, of them. We're heading towards 20 uh, exhibitors in a really, really see that, that you mentioned a name. See, I, I, I think it's good to talk about these people, obviously, because it's all about independence. But Paul Gabba, hardly anybody knows that guy, and um, people in the know know about him. That guy is an absolute genius, seriously. And he's so on, so on assuming I've been, yep. I've been for a meal with him stacks of times when we used to all meet at Bars of World and me and Andreas and Horbeck and everybody always used to go out with Paul Gabba for a steak over the border. Yeah. Um, no, he, he is an absolute, uh, he, he, he is one of the forefathers of contemporary independent yeah. watchmaking. Yeah, um, we, cut, we cut off, we cut off for a second. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. He, and he's, he never brags about what he's done. Um, and yet people in the know, that guy is an absolute genius. And I mean, people don't understand. Well, everyone goes out the Vacheron, what was on about the Vacheron watch saying it's the most complex in the world. It's Paul Gabbers, the thing that he worked on and he's still working on it to this day for yeah. a collector, improving it and adding things yeah. like that. And then he More did the, yeah. the incredible thing that nobody's ever seen called the jumping frog, which was absolutely amazing. I don't know if you've ever seen it, Pietro. Um, I, and the, I, I, no, I haven't. I haven't. But I'm coming to the festival, so I'm. I'm hoping. Yeah, the jumping frog. It's a. It's a frog that literally jumps from lily pad to lily pad, and um, it's crazy. And the, <laughs> the guy, honestly, to see people like him, um, it's well worth a visit because you will never get to see Paul anywhere. He never does shows. He just. He's always in the background, hanging around, um, and that's it. I, I like. I, I, I. There's very special. Uh, thing happening as well involving Paul uh, that he has sworn me to yeah. sign for, but uh, to keep your keep your uh, your radar open yeah, for, uh, if for you are, like Paul, if, Paul Gerber. If, Listen, do you know something? We've got a couple of questions here that have gone on answered, yeah, and, yeah. and we also, David, there's a bloody watch we haven't talked about. <laughs> oh, there's a couple. <laughs> Wait, which one? Uh, it's coming out in December, but uh, let me first of all just touch a couple of uh, questions here that uh, we, we, we've got. Uh, uh, John uh, Chan has asked, any plans to offer the regulator watch, or I guess any of the Garrett collection? I, I, knew, I knew somebody was going to ask that question. The, the, the problem is we're, we're trying to – it's difficult. We don't know. We're in a bit of a um, funny position at the moment. We want to try and up and try and do everything like with an exclusive caliber and whatnot, like we did with the S5 and everything else. So we're trying to get away from using modified ETAs um, and whatnot. But the thing is to do something like the regulator in a 3839, it, it takes a lot of money. It means developing something new. Um, you know, even if we work with Andreas on doing something, it, it's big money, you know, you yeah. know, um, it, you know, and we, uh, we, I don't know is the answer. We don't have the funds at the moment as a, as a small brand. And oh, I've been brutally really honest that's... about that. You know, I, I believe in hiding nothing. Um, it's a major investment for anybody doing stuff like that. And even the time to sit there for Simon, to sit there for months and months and months or even years and design something and put something on paper, we're just we're not in a position to do it. So we're toying yeah. with the idea at the moment, do we modify something? Or do we bite the bullet, wait a year or two, and then um, do something else? You know, we do have the S5 movement, um, and we might be able to do a regulator um, with that, but it's going to be a year's worth of work um, to, yeah, to yeah. do something. 
Um, so okay, so, so that, that, it, we're thinking about it definitely, but it's, yeah, it's down but to it's money. Not, not in the foreseeable. So uh, yeah. next one was uh, back to Paul W, who's asked again, given the growing size of the independent watchmaking and the small number of watches that are made, it is surely inevitable that demand will rise exponentially at some point. How will Dave cope? I think if I could maybe jump in and answer that for you, or at least give my answer to that, would be I think that you are going to go at the pace that you are comfortable with and that if anybody yeah. has to cope, it is the customers who are going to have to cope with the knowledge that there's an extended kind of a waiting list for, uh, yeah, for the it, it's um, it's extremely frustrating, and uh, we can't cope as it is, um, which is putting pressure on everybody. I mean, I've just had a watchmaker leave um, to, uh, last week. I had one leave a year ago. Um, the pressure is uh, is big, and um, you know, and that's the the issue. We can't really. We we have to stay at a pace we're comfortable with, like you said, Johnny. Um, you know, but but what we are trying to do is weed out some certain watches. Um, and, and maybe at the moment our collection's always around five. We're maybe limited to three or four. Um, and, and the watches that cause us the biggest issues, because I'll try and be brief because there's probably a couple more questions. The watches that cause us the biggest issues are the, the entry level watches. I say entry level, uh, and they're not yeah. to some people, are the S4s and the S6s, because that obviously that, that's the biggest, the vast majority of orders. And um, we're doing them, which means we can't do the. The, the higher end stuff, which takes up more hours in finishing and everything else, oh, and sure. that puts us in a bad position. You know, prototyping. Um, we've been prototyping the deadbeat seconds for God knows how long. Uh, the regulator have been prototyping for God knows how long. We just don't have the time to do yeah. anything. So if, um, the answer is we can't grow. Yeah. And if I can, if I can just add quickly, uh, the reason why we do these interviews and we try to give information in advance, the reason why we have a private collector's Instagram account, the reason why we do our newsletters is yeah. to try to always give a heads up before things happen so people that are really interested can have a chance, you know, to put their name down and to peacefully then wait for the production and allocation of one piece. Uh, back to you, Johnny. Yeah, one last one is uh, not so much a question as a statement of fact from Rodia, who once again, thanks a million, Rodia, for watching... Cool so often um, uh, uh, being a, a regular uh, uh, contributor to our episodes. So uh, Rodzia is saying to David, I will buy a Garrick watch. And that's I'll a be problem. looking out for so that. That's the kind of question <laughs> uh, you, you like to see for sure. So you yeah. actually touched on something that really I'm not sure how many people know about. Um, it's called, the, you've been working on your deadbeat second. Yeah. You know what? Yeah, so so we, we as you as you do on the side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, we're working on a lot of things on the side. Uh, it's just that they, they take a long time to do. Uh, but no, we announced it last year to a few collectors, and um, so we we sold it out before we'd even made it. Um, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, yeah. So it's. Um, we, we've got a, a collector's group in uh, Hong Kong that ordered the first pieces and, and, a, and a couple of collectors in America. That's the first batch spoken for. Uh, we've been prototyping it for a long time, uh, toying with a few different dial designs um, as well. And, um, oh. you know, I think it's a stunner, personally. It's um, absolutely spectacular. You know, actually, it's worth touching on something here because a lot of people don't understand sometimes and, and and we get a few comments snidey comments on on social media sometimes saying what you know it's not fair that you announce these watches and you pre-sell it means they're out of reach of everybody but i have to point out something that brands like us that's how that's what enables us to generate funds and, and do prototyping if we don't do that and we don't sell in advance it's difficult for us as a brand and so it's worth making that point people you know need to understand the way we work as a small there's, brand. there's another way is to be in touch with the limited edition because you'll always know the you know the, the, the yeah secret. well that's the other point you, you get to know <laughs> things before time. anybody else Pietra that's a fact <laughs> um, you know well it's a fact we discuss it all the time and I, I often set, shoot you across pictures and say what do you think to this um, you know I, I do it all the time but this is going to be a, a big thing for us um, you know we've had a lot of interest and um, I think it's a lovely looking watch uh, but strangely enough the, the collectors group that ordered the first batch um, have all gone for the original aesthetic of the, which is um, the skeletonized heat blue chapter ring and whatnot. so um, you know wow. that's kind of what we're, that's what we're working on at the moment but the thing is We've got all these projects on the go. It's extremely difficult for us, really. The, you know, we've got 
two watchmakers and um, and a and Simon, and uh, it's finding the hours to do everything. Um, it's just crazy. And because we're just building nonstop, um, it's putting everybody under pressure. Um, you know, I'd love to do two or three watches a year, but we just can't do it. Um, yeah. We really can't. No, it's 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 amazing. And, and, and your, your S3 Mark II as well, which to me is just... Uh, Beauty. Uh, oh, unbelievable. It's just be well, beautiful. Well, you know what? I, I was actually quite surprised. We had, when we showed the images of the concept we 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 had a lot of brands contact us which was really nice honestly and uh, loads of brands um sending me messages saying love the watch um which was fantastic for us that's praise indeed um really yeah you know when you when you get feedback from other brands that is a that is a real good thing it, you know it puts you on a high I mean, well, listen, getting, there's, ups and there's ups and downs running a watch brand, ups and downs all the time and, um, you know, uh, and pressure, a lot of pressure. Um, you know, we chose to do things this way and we, we put ourselves under pressure trying to deliver, um, you know, but, uh, you know, it, it's that's why people buy from us. And um, so far, we, we seem to be going OK. But, you know, the, the other issue you have as well with, with all these watches is, uh, you know, it's a long test period. We test for weeks before we send the watches out. And that's another thing that causes delays. Uh, you know. yeah. no, it's, uh... Gentlemen, I, I feel so guilty to have to uh, uh, wrap up on this great oh, conversation, which... For your information, we may use as a first episode of our podcast as well that I think we need to get out there. Uh, it was so good, David. We started with the idea of uh, obviously uh, informing people about the plan of launching this, um, uh, this uh, regulator, Mark II. Uh, and we ended up giving a lot of insider information about you know the launch of the new S3, Skeleton Eyes, the launch of the Deadbeat. And again, for us... As difficult as it could be to, to get a, a Garrick watch for the inner natural limitation of the production, if you get in touch now, it's, it's the right time to put your name down and you can do that at the limited edition. <laughs> of course, if you want to have a conversation with, with, with David directly as the great man is, uh, he will always be, be there for you. Uh, well, we're trying to help uh, David on that side and take care of uh, you know yeah. the... the the customer service kind of uh, kind of uh, side of things, uh, and in, an immense uh, thank you to to Johnny for organizing this, uh, uh, David for being with us again. Uh, David will be in September on the twenty second or twenty fourth of September at the International Festival of Time in Waterford, in the beautiful Waterford, Ireland. Only two hours by bus from Dublin Airport, uh, right? You, you get out of the arrivals at Dublin Airport, there is a bus taking you directly there in the, in the midst of the action. And there is a lineup of watchmakers that is simply not seen not seen before. So uh, if you are a limited edition collector, you have received our first invite yesterday uh, on our uh, secret uh, Instagram account that you can access to if you have purchased from the limited edition before. Uh, otherwise, whoever is on our WhatsApp uh, group uh, broadcast, we receive the invite as well. So, David, I'm looking forward to seeing you there in real life, having a couple of drinks and having a more Absolutely. or less intelligent conversations as we were we were planning to do. That's going to be fantastic. Yeah, I, I I'll be at the airport there. waiting for me limousine to arrive. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking, like you, you, you know, you're you're probably waiting on a, a, a coach I'll, to arrive. I'm, dri <laughs> I'm driving <laughs> in my in my. I'm driving in my Italian Panda, uh, so I can pick you up from the airport. Yeah, that would be cool. Well, I'll, I'll hold you to that, because I, I hate going by train or anything else. <laughs> so, Gentlemen, yeah, well, thank you very much. One of the little uh, things about uh, the little idiosyncrasies about uh, the Festival of Time is that it's uh, in Waterford, and it is, uh, unfortunately, uh, while uh, the, uh, Aaron does not have a fantastic uh, transport infrastructure, much to its shame and much that our yeah. politicians should be absolutely it, it, it makes it a great boys weekend you know lads weekend oh, right? yeah. so it makes yeah. it and for lads and ladies there's plenty because i tell you what yeah. the, the, the exhibition is taking place in the medieval museum in the center of waterford the Cracking medieval spot, museum yeah. is an absolute cornucopia of artifacts of historical artifacts that tell the whole story of uh, Irish uh, political, civil history and cultural history. There is the Irish Museum of Time, which is another building. 
there is a further building called the Irish Silver Museum. And there's also uh, the uh, a new museum only opened a couple of weeks ago, and it's called the Irish Wake Museum. And I don't know if you know what a wake is, wow. guys, but in Ireland, when we pop our clogs, yeah, I know. We're, we're we're ready for it. We're, there's and I tell a party you, I tell ready you now. to swing into action. As, and, uh, so, but it's a, 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 I, a new I tell you there's, what, there's so much to see. We'll we'll have a special uh, edition and an episode of these live sessions of the independence dedicated to that. And I we can do that in a couple of weeks. I think Johnny sure because it's yeah, now the yeah. time to officially announce it as you're gonna do very soon. So yeah, let's put that in the diary. All good, all good. And there's a, a parting word from uh, John Chan saying thank you for the great interview with Dave. Look forward to the public launch of the Dead Beat Seconds model. Thank you, Fantastic. John. It's been a brilliant interview and uh, just as ever, David, you're a fantastic guest. And uh, cool. Thank you. And this is yeah. the end of the Irish man, the Italian man, and the British man talking watches. I <laughs> hope you nice. enjoy this. I hope you enjoy this. But if you meet us live, it's going to be even better. So the appointment is at the end of September in Ireland. We'll wait for you all over there. Uh, thank you so much, David, for your time. We don't take it for granted. I know how busy you are. And thank you, Johnny, for organizing this. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. See you all very soon. Bye-bye.